and it goes to the copy editor. Oh, God, I can't take it anymore. How many iterations of this book there have been? You can go blind from doing a book. This is an easier ways to make money than writing books, let me tell you, particularly good books. Now, if you're the hemorrhoid, what you do is you take books that other people have written that you steal, and you have a, a ghostwriter put paraphrases around Thomas Paine's writings, and you call it your book. You know, you code it with a little preparation H, and, and the American people think you... It's unbelievable to me what passes for a book today. They put their name on it, and it's not a book. I write real books. I write Persian miniatures. Each of my books is a classic. I take pride in it. I'm actually a writer by training and by inclination, because I'm a quiet person. I know you don't believe it. I really am a quiet person. I, I feel like taking a vow of silence, but I can't do it yet. I, that's why I started this show. That's, I know that there's an Arabic, Arabic saying... Uh, that says, if you cannot improve upon the silence of the of the desert, don't speak. I like that. Of course, that was a way of controlling uh, people. Fine. But it's actually very well put. Silence is golden in a way. But how do you go from this to, you know, from a thousand to zero? How do you take a man who's a test pilot, basically, and tell him to never fly again? I'm like a test pilot. Every day I get up and fly at supersonic uh, speeds and at supersonic al altitudes. 80,000 feet, 85,000 feet. I fly till the wings almost fall off the plane. In fact, sometimes they have fallen off the plane, and I've had a parachute out of some of the test craft. <laughs> I think I've bailed out five times now and survived. But how do you go from that life to zero? How is it possible? I don't know if I just fish. Just I don't know. Maybe it's possible. I admire people who are taciturn. Don't get me wrong. I don't think everyone has to be hyperverbal. To, to be intelligent. I learned that there are very intelligent people who don't speak very well or don't speak at all. I understand that as well. But I don't think you can just turn it off. It'd be like taking a silent person and saying, here's a microphone, talk for three hours a day, make sense, be humorous, be entertaining, keep the show going, keep 100 balls in the air, and, and have people come back for more. Impossible. So the reverse is true, too. Now you could say meditation. I don't believe in meditation. Talk about things like that. I tried it. It's like, I remember the years that I tried to meditate. I sat on a floor and put my hands together with other people. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I almost went nuts from it. What do you mean meditation? How can you enforce meditation on people unless they're in a prison? Remember the age of feedback, biofeedback, that Hazarai, that they made it up, biofeedback. <laughs> remember the biofeedback? I remember once I went to a doctor in the 80s for something. I don't know what it was. I already showed signs and was worried about it, but uh, try biofeedback. I didn't know what it was. I sat with like a, thing, a machine that had a slight hum with a wire, and I was supposed to stare at it. And I picked up a signal. I was supposed to send back the signal. Picked up the, you know what I decided to do? Watch more television because the alpha waves was something I could tune, in, tune into and send back waves to. You know what I mean? The alpha waves of television worked for me. I tried them. I couldn't do biofeedback. I can't do meditation. It's the same with yoga. I don't understand yoga. I'm not saying that there isn't anything to it. But it's, again, to each his own. It's not for me. Again, I can't sit on a floor with a leotard and bend over and twist my legs up and down. They're like modified sexual postures from the Kama Sutra to begin with. Let me give you my in intuition on it anyway. I'll tell you later another time. If this wasn't a family show, I'll tell you where yoga came from. You have to trace it back to the Kama Sutra and the positions in the Kama Sutra. Then you've got to understand that a lot of the people in those ancient days were manipulators, and the people were all serfs. And they, they basically told people what to do. They could come in. The guy wouldn't go into the sexual things. All right, we're going to meditate now. Bend over that way and put your leg over your head and you know, sit there and hum, and I'll be back in three hours. All right, I'm going to take a break now. Savage. The fusion of entertainment and enlightenment. I'm Glenn Beck, weekdays, noon to 3 on Talk 910 KNEW. the savage nation we're talking about this and that that and this on the savage nation from politics to to recipes to lipoprotein lipoprotein a whatever you want to talk about on the savage nation i mean i think that's what makes talk radio fabulous R uh, richard in florida you're next up go ahead please uh yes dr savage uh i haven't heard you really talk much about art and i was curious uh what movement in the 20th century uh did you have a liking for or Okay, it's a good question. Now, I know when you say 20th century, there are limitations, but uh, I'd have to go back to the Impressionists, which, of course, may not meet that uh, that time frame. Is that correct? Well, 
you're right, but I, I meant those two. They are late, more they were the late 19th century. But uh, I just wondered how you thought about the German expressionists or the, you know, the foes. Well, look, everyone has their own tastes. I am still attached mostly to the era of Gauguin. I still, if I go to a museum, I go immediately to the Impressionists. You could say I grew up on them. I mean, we didn't have any in my house, but I always gravitated to Gauguin as my favorite. In fact, when I was able, when I was older and collecting plants in the South Pacific, I made certain to visit some of the islands uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the chain in which he, in, he lived. He, oh, I mean, these are amazing places to go to. You have to go to the Marquesas, one of the you know, most uh, obscure islands on Earth, to see where he painted and the people actually looked like he made them in his paintings with those very, very dramatically angular faces, the, the land of the man, the land of man. I, I'm still nuts about almost everything Picasso has ever done. I wouldn't declare that Manet was an Impressionist, but Manet's painting, Bar at the Follies Berger, 1881, who can ever forget that one of the bar girl with the dower, with the kind of sad face, with the beautiful outfit looking out from behind the bar? You know the one I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, how can anyone ever forget that painting? And they, they don't even know who painted it. But Monet would be more the Impressionist than Manet, obviously. And Monet, I mean, how many times can you look at a water lily? Apparently he couldn't get enough of them. What I'm most impressed uh, about Monet was the fact that in his later years he was crippled, I believe with arthritis, and he had his assistant attach the paintbrush to his hand with a, with a rope or a string, rather, and he continued to paint till almost the day he died. That was an amazing story, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, sir. So that doesn't really answer your it doesn't really answer your question, nor am I technically uh, c c able to give you technical statements about any of these things. It's all a matter of personal taste and what you know what strikes you. So of the, of those people mentioned, which would you say is your favorite? Uh, I I would say of those people mentioned, I guess Gauguin. The po he was a post impressionist. He and Van Gogh, but uh, I guess Gauguin. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I mean, but I studied almost every biography ever written about that man because he fascinated me in that he was a stockbroker in Paris, left the family, moved to Tahiti, tried to paint, sent the paintings back, none of them sold, and then he retreated to even uh, further reaches of the uh, French Polynesian area. And wherever he went, he got into trouble. If there was one official on the island, which there was, he wound up in a lawsuit with that one official. He hated authority. Yeah, I can really relate to, uh, <laughs> to to Gauguin. I remember he moved, I think it was uh, Hiva Oa. There was one French official on that island, and he locked horns with that official over something. And uh, they wound up in, in terrible straits with each other. He hated any authority whatsoever. I think his painting reflects that, don't you think? Yes, I think he was a scoundrel of sorts. He was a scoundrel. I like that scoundrel part of him. <laughs> no, you have to admire that kind of scoundrel. I mean, he didn't shoot anybody. Now, he did. He did. He did die of yours. I don't know if you know that. Did you know that? Is that syphilis? Well, it is related to syphilis, and it was a result of his uh, screwing around with a lot of young girls in the Tahiti Islands, and I'm talking about underage girls. He was known for that. Uh, it was not considered a moral uh, crime in those days in those parts of the world, but certainly everybody understands he wasn't doing the young girls a favor. In fact, the one thing to say to a young girl is don't waste uh, uh, your your young years on old on, on uh, don't don't waste your youth on old age. But they didn't understand it; they were poor, and he took advantage of them. Sure. But I don't think that diminishes from his art. You know, I, I still must tell you that Van Gogh still wipes me away. If I get no next to a painting of Van Gogh's, it changes my my mind chemistry. I'll never forget as long as I live. I went into a museum in San Francisco when they once had a great Van Gogh collection. And they had them without glass on front of them. And there's one painting that he painted toward the end of his life when he was totally crazy, when he was losing his mind completely. And the thickness of the oil and the swirls, if you look very close at his face, if he got within an inch of his painting, which I did, they let you get that close. That's before the psycho started coming into museums and, and slashing paintings. You had to get real close to that 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 Van Gogh portrait, self portrait. <clears throat> the painting were it was in swirls of his own face, and when you looked right at it, you you no longer saw a face. What you saw was swirls of color going in circles, which probably mimicked what was going on inside his head in a way that nobody can understand unless you're crazy. Because there's a certain joy in being mad that only mad men know, as one uh, a, a writer wrote. The phone number here, I don't even want to give you anymore. I just want the man ask me a question. I gave him an answer. 
And I hope that the answer was of some interest to some of you out there. And I hope it stimulates interest in real art again, because, again, with the Internet, I think people have lost the idea that you even have to go next to a painting to see the painting. Press a button, click, click, there's Monet, there's Monet, there's Gauguin, and you think you see it. Well, you do. You see it in two dimension. But paintings were really painted for the third dimension. And they have to be looked at from a certain distance, meaning the, the right perspective. There's a very famous story of Gauguin's Green Horse, which I, until recently, I think, I think it still does, it has an entire room devoted to it. One painting, an entire room at the Louvre in Paris. A whole room, the Green Horse. And he painted it, he couldn't sell any of his paintings. So a local pharmacist liked him, and he commissioned a painting of his horse in his pasture. So Gauguin works on this uh, painting for months. He comes over to the pharmacist's house. He unveils the painting. The pharmacist says, let me see the painting. He unveils it, and he says, but that's not my horse. You made the horse green. And Gauguin says to the pharmacist who commissioned the painting, but sir,